Right off the bat, I saw Todd Graham, and uh, I don't know if I saw Gina. Is Gina here? Gina, no? G Gina's here? Oh my gosh, you're a super mom. Every, I mean, every, you know, you have freedom to just sit at home and be there for weeks now. I mean, and look at you, you're, you're here. Okay, you guys are like, what's going on? Todd and Gina Graham had their baby this wet last week in an emergency. Grant Sterling was four pounds exactly? Three eight. Three eight. Three eight. So... Um, and obviously early, and he's in the, uh, in the NICU right now, but doing well, um, eating 12 ml, is that five, five at five right now, is it five, five, six, ten, okay, I'm not even close, um, but uh, yeah, and I wanted to say right now, a prayer of thanks to God, I should have included them, sorry I didn't, and I saw him, I'm like, we have to pray for this, so thanks to God, and then continued, you know, just growth in, in Grant Sterling, we have a new baby for the nursery. Nursery training was big time last week, so man, there are lots of babies on their way. Um, let's pray. God, thank you so, so much for what you've done this past week in the Graham household. Um, thank you that, man, when they went in and, and everything was in uncertainty, so many people were praying and knowing that you are able, God. And, and Father, you, you did. Um, you answered um, in the way that we prayed, Father, and we thank you for that. Thank you for Grant's life right now that he's sitting there being um, tended to by your angels. Um, and so, God, thank you that he's eating well, he's healthy, and growing. I'd be, be with the brothers, um, Gavin and Gabe, um, as they're, uh, you know, going to find out what it's like to have a baby in the home. So that's really cool. And so, Father, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome, Grams. Whew, love it, love it, love it. God is just working. Um, and, and I'm hoping, hope, um, hoping that you are continuing to see that in your own lives. But also you're, you're hearing that more just in stories that we've been covering in Scripture. We, uh, man, we were closing out this series uh, today. If, you, if you're tired of the series, then congratulations. If you are loving it, then I'm sad for you. I mourn with you. But the closing of this series is, I think, uh, is again about what we've seen happen over these last week, uh, eight weeks of Christ actually coming into the lives of people and encountering people and, and, you know, and spending time with them. And week after week, we were seeing that the Father God we know redeeming people from where they were. Father God we know who was redeeming people out of their struggles, people who faced struggles spiritually and emotionally, people who struggled physically, who were struggling with the culture around them. And an encounter with Christ helped change that. Matter of fact, it it overall changed that. And so if one thing we've seen over and over again, it's that God does this. He redeems, he frees people, and then he sends people. And I think what happens is, as, as even right now in the church and right now in our world, is that we, we can say, you know, yeah, I go to church or I go, and, and Christ maybe redeemed you and maybe he gave you freedom but we miss out on, the, on some of the parts. We miss out on the part of now, what, where is he sending me? And what it is, what, what now, God? What, what am I going to do now? I mean, that, you know, our what's next, when I was talking about that, it's not just a quick program to try to get you busy doing stuff. It's really, you've been redeemed, maybe you've been free of all the baggage, and now, where are you going? You know, where is he going to send you? That's what a true believer says. Here I am. Here I am. You freed me. You redeemed me. Now what? What am I going to do? And so in these stories we've seen, you know, God the Father, Christ himself as well, redeeming and freeing and sending people. And so it's important for us to know that each story that we see is about God rescuing someone and then getting them back on the right track, getting them back on the right path. And I mean, when you look around in here today, I can look around at, at some of you and there's several of you in here today that have a story of your own near recent involvement in church, your recent involvement in God growing in your life, and your recent rescuing. That you just knew, you, if you look back on it, you saw that maybe your, 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 your home, your life was on a path that was for destruction. And maybe there wasn't, you're like, no one's going to die maybe, but you just saw that there was going to be broken relationships, there was going to be this going on, and something happened where there was rescue. And in your involvement in great community or your involvement in scripture helped change that and rescue you. Um, yesterday I went to our in-laws to do some work and help with over there. And we, so we showed up, and the Friday afternoon we showed up, there was a little baby bird butted up against the garage sitting there 
and couldn't fly, couldn't do anything, and it obviously had fallen from somebody, fallen from somewhere. So it's sitting there, and I, I'm not very compassionate. So I'm, I'm just like, you know, I'm like, oh, baby bird, walk on, get our luggage, put it in the car, you know. And that doesn't, that's not how it flies with the ladies, okay. The, the, the Christy, and especially her sister, took this on as this great project. And so her sister found out actually the next, I think the next morning or that, I can't remember when it was, but she found out and it became her passion because she was like emotional, but she's like, we're going to go find this, this bird. Let's go find this bird. And I'm like, you know, I'm sitting there watching British Open. I'm like, all right, guys, you know, I'm like such a jerk. And, and so they're going to do that. And it's like butted up against this deal. And so come to find out they, they took the bird and they, they placed the bird back into the gutter. So they came back and told me that, and I'm like, was that really where the bird is supposed to go? But they were like, no, but that's the safest place. Isn't that gutter's like burning hot, you know? I'm like, you might as well have just taken a lighter and just, <laughs> you know? But no, they put the bird back in because in their mind, in their heart, that was rescue, right? They were like, we're just going to, and so they came back into the room or back into the, in the dining room. They were telling us, and her little daughter, she's like six or seven, and she has these tears in her eyes, and Kelly's like has tears in her eyes and they're just like broken for this little baby bird and at the time I'll, I'll be honest with you I was like that's really cool good job guys you know man great shot tiger I was just like <laughs> you know and, I, and I'm and I'm thinking I'm a jerk but this morning as I'm like coming in here I was thinking that story that compassion is God's story with us that compassion is that we are, don't, aren't we broken and we're butted up against the garage and we're just like, you know, we, there's, we're just like, we don't know what to do and there's people walking by us just like, ah, good luck, you know, um, that was me. And then there's other people that maybe are walking around there, just, there's just this great godly compassion that they may have for you and that's the strong community that God is just asking you to get plugged into or maybe or to get connected with and then through these people or through whatever, they, they lift you up and there's just this, this great rescue that happens. And in these stories that we've been looking at, I can't help but to think that this is what Christ is about in our lives. He's about rescuing us, freeing us, redeeming us, and then sending us back on the right path, regardless of how young or old you are in here today. So today's story that we're going to talk about is no, um, it's no different. And matter of fact, I believe that it's probably one of the greatest conversions, if not the greatest conversions, that we know in the Christ Christian movement. And it puts a bow on this series, but for this conversion, or what the dictionary says, listen to this, what conversion means. Some of you are like, have you ever heard this? When you're, oh, he's not going to convert me. You know, you ever heard someone say that? Or, oh, he's converted, or whatever. We say words, and we're so dumb sometimes. Like, we just say them, and then when people think that they're words that you shouldn't, I mean, they're just they Christianese type words, so we just don't say them anymore. But do you know when we read scripture what conversion means? Conversion means a change of someone's character. It means a change of the form that they were taking, the shape that they were taking. That's the substance that they were. So when someone was converted or they were going through a conversion, do you know what God was doing? He was changing their character. He was changing their substance. He was changing their form. And then he was sending them off. And so when we hear of conversion, or the greatest conversion in the Christian movement, had to have happened with a guy that we know his name is Saul, who wrote most of the New Testament, more than half of the New Testament, as Paul. And the resurrected Christ needed to show up to this man and to bring conversion to him. I want to read you, though, of something about, um, about blindness. I saw this story this week, and I wanted to share this, uh, because, we're, you know, this whole thing is about being blind to actually see. In his book, An Anthropologist on Mars, neurologist Oliver Sacks tells a story about a guy named Virgil that he knew. Virgil was a man who had been blind from early childhood. And when he was 50, Virgil underwent this amazing surgery and was given the gift of sight. You ever seen that? What's that movie? The, the Brad Pitt? What, anybody remember that movie? Yes, yes. And that has nothing to do with this. I just thought about that just now. Thank you, Brady. Um, now, you were really moved by that, weren't you? That was, that was a love story. That was a love story. Yeah. Anyways, Virgil underwent a surgery, was given the gift of sight, but as he and Dr. Sachs found out, having the physical capacity to see 
is not the same as seeing. Let me say that again. Having the physical capacity for sight is not the same as seeing. Virgil's first experiences with, with sight were confusing. He was able to make out colors. He was able to make out movements. But arranging them actually into a coherent picture was more difficult. Over time, he learned to identify various objects. But his habits, his behaviors, they were still those of a blind man. Dr. Sachs asserts, One must die as a blind person to be born again as a seeing person. It is the interim, the limbo in there, that is so terrible. You see, I believe, as we're going to see in this story, to truly see what Jesus is doing in our lives means to be more than observing about what he did on the cross before. And what, he, what great story that was. But it means for us a, a change of our identity. It means for us a change in maybe our lifestyle. It means for us a conversion. Well, in Acts 9... We come to a story where there was a guy named Saul. Now I want to give you a quick background before we go into the scripture. Because Saul was a man who had just taken part in the stoning of a guy named Stephen. And Stephen was what the Bible would say was the first Christian martyr. He, Stephen came in front of the hierarchy of the church and he said, listen, of the synagogue. And he said, listen, this is what Christ was about. You are waiting for this king. But let me tell you, the king has already come. And he came and brought this T.D. Jake style message. And he's just like sweating and everything else. And he's just bringing it to them. And this, 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 the hierarchy, the Pharisees were saying, we've already heard this before. And it was from a man who's now dead. And Stephen was saying to them, no, the man is now dead was the one who's resurrected. And he would just correct them. And he had this, I mean, this tone to them. Well, they were getting more angry. They were getting just, just so angry. So they decided that they were going to stone Stephen. Well, he became the first Christian martyr. Well, what the Bible tells us as the man who held the coats of the men who threw the stones was a guy named Saul. And from that stoning, the first Christian, you know, persecuted death being Stephen, from that stoning started a major persecution in the church. That anybody who called Christ the king, Saul had the authority to bring them in and have them put into prison. To bring them in and have them beaten. To bring anyone who said, yeah, I, Jesus is the Lord. You're arrested. Bring them in. Take them in and beat them until they would say he's not the Lord anymore. And this, that event with Stephen and Saul being a part of that and consenting to that started the, a great persecution in the church. And that time in Jerusalem and the disciples and anybody who would call on the name of Christ scattered from Jerusalem. But Christ had a great plan for that as well. So we pick up in Acts 9, 1 through 9. I want to read this to you. So then Saul... Still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Anyone who was in freedom like this, who would come and call on the name of Christ and sing these great songs. He's breathing threats against them and murder against them. And he went to the high priest and he asked letters from them to the synagogues of Damascus. We may say, what, what's, what, why did he need letters? Because these high priests said, these letters that you hold will give you the letters. These give you the right. When you go to Damascus, that any Christian you find, any person who calls on the name of the Lord, you can drag them back to Jerusalem and put them into prison. And so Saul went and he asked for these letters. And so that he found anybody who were of the way, which is what they called, I love this, because when people were called of the way, those were called of people who believed in Christ. You ever heard someone say, man, he's really lost his way. We still say that, right? And I'm like, man, that, that phrasing is like, when someone's just like way off, I mean, they're just like gone. And we say that still, we're like, man, he's kind of just lost his way. Well, the, back then, the way was the, actually the, the connection with Christ that people had. And so... Um, Picked up right here, it says, So that if he found anyone who were of the way, whether men or women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly, a light shone around him from heaven. 
Right around the time, by the way, it was, uh, I was reading, it was around noon was around the time that this happened. So it was already bright, by the way. And so what this, what, how it's told in here and even in chapter 22 is that Paul saw this great light, brighter than the sun, that was shining, that came around him. And it fell from heaven. Then he fell to the ground. And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? More than just the light. It was the resurrected Christ. Now why is this important? It's because this guy, Saul, was speaking against the resurrected Christ. Remember the, the, the actual story was that the disciples stole the body? That they moved this stone somehow? They drugged the soldiers? I don't know. And they moved the stone away and then they stole the body away and, and that's why they believe in this resurrected Christ? I mean, that's the rumor that was going around. But what we read is that over 500 men and women saw the resurrected Christ after, after he had died on the cross he moved the stone away and he showed himself to that many people and Saul still was not with it. And right here instead of there just being an angel that said hey you really should be believe in Christ I love this that the resurrected, resurrected Christ came to this situation and he said the one that you're persecuting is right here. And then he said, Paul said, or Saul said, excuse me, and he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And he says, It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I don't know if any of you read that and thought, Weird, what does that mean? And then you just kind of kept going and thought, Great story. You know what Jesus was saying to them? Saying to Saul? He was saying, isn't it really hard for you to actually kick against the movement that I have? You keep trying your best, but the goads, which would be the stimulus of all that, that I have created, is going everywhere. And so um, when we see that, we say, well, Paul's probably like, yeah, it is hard. And what happened, remember in Jerusalem when I said they scattered everywhere? Well, when these disciples of Christ scattered everywhere, they went from town to town spreading the gospel. And it was just spreading like wildfire. Why do you think we're sitting here today? Because it's so hard to kick against the movement. And that's what Saul was doing. He, was, he had so much zeal and so much passion to kill and to, to maim and to imprison every Christian he could find. But they were scattered about telling the story of the resurrected Christ. And that's why Jesus was saying, it's pretty hard for you, isn't it? So Saul, he was trembling and astonished. And he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, he says, arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless. They, hear, they could hear this voice, but they couldn't see anyone. And then Saul arose from the ground. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. See, as I'm reading this story and this encounter that Saul had with Jesus, he's going through a moment of blindness in his life. He's going through this moment because isn't that how it is? Isn't that how it is for us that when we're, when we're really going through a conversion, there's this moment in our life that maybe we are in the dark so much that we just can't see. And maybe there's people around us that are trying to take us to and fro in every which way. But it's really maybe not the exact place we want to go and we just can't see. And I love in this story that Saul had to be blinded for him to actually have true sight on who Christ was. It says he was blind for three days. He was struggling in the dark. So then he goes on. And there was a certain disciple. And we go over to Ananias. I want to read this. It's so important. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus. His name was Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. Why did he say that? Because that's what believers say. When the Lord calls, we say, here I am. That's what believers say. Ananias, known to be a believer, 
he said, here I am. What can I do? So the Lord said to him, Arise, I want you to go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas, because that's where there's a man named Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is there praying. And in the vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, so that he might receive sight. So then Ananias is a little confused because he knows who Saul of Tarsus is. And he says, like, don't you know this is this man who's killing all of us? It's funny how he tries to reason with Christ knowing that I mean, this is Christ you're talking about. I'm sure he already knows this. But just in case, Ananias is saying, but I just, I, this is good and everything, but you want me to call him brother? Brother, are you serious? And he's killing and he's imprisoning and he's arresting all of us? You see, this is what Christ does to our old life. Then Ananias answered, he's telling him this, and what the Lord said to him, he said, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. What's amazing about this is is that I think at times we feel like we've done, we've, we can't be converted. Our character can't change. Our substance can't change. And would Christ really use us? And this was a guy who every pastor in the world always comes back to and says, this guy was killing Christians. He was persecuting the church. He held the jackets of the men who were stoning the first Christian martyr. And now the wording that Christ used to Ananias says he will be a chosen vessel of mine to preach the word to the Gentiles and to the kings and to the Jews. You may be sitting in here thinking, you know, can I be used to do something great because I did this, because I'm involved with this, because maybe I'm apathetic, because I, I've just been playing church. I, whatever all the excuses you maybe can come up with, the hope we see is right here. That true conversion can really happen in each and every one of us. And it's amazing how creative it is. You may say, well, what did he have to suffer? Listen to what Paul boasts about. Because you may say, well, you know, what did he really have to suffer? Paul boasting all in the life that he had with Christ. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 11. You don't have to look it up. I'll just go. I'm just going to go real quick, real quick. It says, in labors... More abundant in stripes, more above measure in prisons, more frequently in deaths, more often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, perils of water and perils of robbers and perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles and perils of the city. In perils in the wilderness in perils in the sea, in perils among false brothers, in weariness and in toil, in sleeplessness often, and in hunger and in thirst, and in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes up upon me daily is my deep concern for all the churches. He says, who is weak? I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? That was Paul's suffering for the namesake of Christ. So Ananias went on his way and he entered the house of Judas, back over in Acts 9. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul. Imagine what it took for him to say that. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to you on the road. As you came, he sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from the, his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. You know what, what healed his blindness, don't you? It was his belief that that was Christ on that road. That's what healed him. It wasn't this just, that's a part of the story that, oh, Ananias showed up, lays hand on him. It, isn't there belief that has to be involved in that? And what we saw from Paul's speech and what we see from the story is that he said, Who are you, Lord? Where do you want me to go? And then what did Jesus say? He's at Judah's house and he's praying right now. And he shows up and Ananias lays hands on him 
And he says, I'm here to baptize you that you may be filled with the same spirit every one of us have. Why do we love this story? It's because when we go forward, we see that Saul was freed and redeemed, right? By the Lord Jesus himself. And then he was sent. In your bulletins, there's a couple places I want you to take a look at as we're sitting here. What do we learn from this story? If you're, if you're someone who's visual and you want to write some things down, please do. Please look at your bulletins because that's where the points will be this morning. Saul, Ananias, and baptism. Here's what we know from the story is that Christ has creative ways in putting our earthly and spiritual lives into perspective. Christ has creative ways in putting our earthly and our spiritual lives into perspective. Isn't it sometimes that we have to go through these periods of blindness for us to come out on the other side and say, you know, now I know what was happening. Now I know why we were going through that. And you can tell anybody who will listen to you, you just want to go from town to town. Well, why do you, what do you think happened with Paul? He said his major ministry was to now go from town to town and to tell the story of what happened on Damascus. And so he had this great testimony of all the blindness that he was in. And then the testimony of the blindness he went through on the road. And then I came out on the other side ready to tell the story. And to tell that Christ is real. And I think for us, that's what we go through at times. And, and God is very creative at that. Putting us into perspective and saying, you know, that's what was happening in that season of my life. That's why we were being patient and waiting. That's why we were going through that. That's why this happened. Because now the perspective is, is that Christ is, is great. He's awesome. He is in my life. And he's very creative. You remember the story of Jonah when Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. And he finally went to Nineveh. Out of the well. Bah, into Nineveh. Preached the message. And then goes out of town because he still didn't like the people. And he's sitting out of town and it's blazing. You remember? And God provides for him shade. And he's over and he's like, oh, this is great. But he all, God also provided the worm to come up and eat that up. And then he burned, right? And then he, he's just lamenting, saying, well, my life, what's wrong with my life? My life's terrible. And God said, how, what you, how can you rejoice about one? And then now your life's terrible. I've been here. What about perspective? And I think that's for us, is that, man, God is so creative. Christ is creative in putting us into perspective. The next one is this. Christ's movement is powerful, it's unstoppable, and it's eternal. His movement is powerful, unstoppable, and eternal. We read in Acts 9, 5, when he says to Paul again, he says, he says why are you kicking against the power of this whole thing? Why do you, why? Why? You just keep kicking against all these ways. Why are you just fighting it? The movement in you is so powerful. And I think that's for us too. Is that why, are we, why do we continually fight and kick against the movement that is already placed in us? To do something just miraculous or extraordinary in our lives. And I think Christ is saying, let's stop kicking against that. And let's watch it happen. Third one. Christ can take the worst part of us. The worst part of us and turn it for good. Needless to say, we, we hear the story of Saul. And I'm not sure it gets any worse than that. As we're sitting in the church, the Christian church right now, and we look back on his life and we say, I don't know if it got any worse than what he did. But Christ turned that for good. And so as you're measuring up your worst right now, and you're thinking, yeah, I don't... I don't know if that, and can Christ turn that? Of course he can. Whatever it was this morning, whatever it was last week, whatever it was a month ago, a year ago, 50 years ago, whatever it was that you can't get rid of, Christ takes the worst in us and he turns that for good. And that's what he did with Saul, who we know as Paul, who wrote over half of the New Testament that your pastor preaches out of. That that's what he does. So there's a question for you today that I want you to take home. I want you to, maybe you already know this. 
that we already know that sometimes we have to be blinded for us to actually come out with the right vision. But what's the worst in you that Christ's movement or his power can turn for good? And are you willing to give that over? Well, here's how Paul did it. He turned and he gave it over in baptism. And he said in front of anybody who would listen, I want my life to mean something. <clears throat> Just so happens that in a week from now, we're going to be doing baptisms. And this story reminds me, and it reminds, I hope, all of you, that conversion can happen. That change in substance in your life can happen, and a change of character can happen. And you don't have to be living in the same trench over and over again. And then you can be sent for great purpose. Well, I want to challenge any of you who have not been baptized, or any of you who are... Um, who maybe were baptized when you were younger and you just don't recollect it. Maybe your parents had you baptized, I don't know. And you just don't recollect that and it hasn't meant to you a change in, in, in your character. I want to I challenge you today to, to think about what that means and to say, I want to be baptized. Um, there's this idea that adults, when they get older, don't, they can't be baptized. It's, it's weird in our church culture. That it's like, ah, you know, I'm too old now to be baptized. Let's do the students or the, or the children. And I, I can tell you right now, that's beautiful to have children baptized and they're coming in. I, I really love that. Something major for me when I see an adult who's lived through all of this and they say in front of the church, I've never been baptized and I want to come, go into that water and come out with a change of substance in my life, a change of form. So next week... We will have our very luxurious, incredible bapti baptistry right here. It's an awesome, awesome event. Um, and if you somewhere today, um, maybe somewhere tomorrow this week, and you're saying, you know, I want, I want to proclaim the name of Christ. I want to be baptized. Please, please, please let me know um, sooner rather than later because I like to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I'll talk about what that means and then ask you three really cool questions um, that I will ask you uh, in front of the church as well. So um, please be thinking about that. Okay, let's pray.